that's it. That's the way. Just wait for Tom to make his entrance then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much. Well. Thanks.
Right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Grand Rounds. My name's Tom Farden. I'm returned to chair Grand Rounds. Thank you to those in the last couple of weeks who've stood in in my absence. It's much appreciated. Um, I'd say it's nice to be back from closer to the equator, but the truth is it's bloody cold, so I'd rather be back in Gran Canaria, but there you go. Um, hello to Perth. Yeah, it's waving. There you go still alive. So um, I'm sorry that the IT keeps screwing up, but I did have a, um, a phone call this, uh, just this lunchtime from the senior head of IT main on main campus who tells me uh, that they're going to give up on this system because it's just they can't fix it. So it's out to tender to get a new system. So we should hopefully have some input into getting a better system that means we can link to Perth properly and that this will be a, uh, a problem of the past. But I don't know how long that will take. Anyway, here's some parish notices before we hand on over to Nikki, um, who's aghast that this is the only picture we could find on the internet of her, but I'm sure uh, she's better in the flesh. So, the Discovery Days 2017 will take place on Friday the 13th of January between 9 and 4.30. For those of you who don't know what these are, uh, the, anyone who's a new professor in the university is invited to give their fresh inaugural professorial talk uh, and this year the School of Medicine is included with Professor Sarah Brown, eczema, getting under your skin, Professor John Dillon, hepatitis, killing a killer disease, and Professor Ghulam Nabi, detection and treatment of bladder, ca uh, kidney and prostate cancer. The tickets are free. They're always very interesting. You can get information at dundee.ac.uk slash discovery days. Um, you can go and give uh, John and Sarah a bit of a hard time at their professorial talk uh, or be there to cheer them on. Forensic Medicine BMSC graduate Eva Peck, and this is she, uh, recently took home a top prize from the National Inspire Intercalators Research Conference with her work, Stab Wounds Dynamics of Kitchen Knives, uh, which is a hell of a thing to spend a year studying. Um, Eva won Best Oral Presentation in an Academic Category, winning a £50 Amazon voucher, so congratulations to her. <laughs> She's going to buy a knife, yes. Uh, here is a, a look at the upcoming staff development opportunities at, this, uh, at the end of this month and into December. Remember, these are all free. Uh, they're half-day courses in the main. A couple of them are just an hour here or there. Some of them come with free lunch. That's the ones with the asterisks. Uh, in a recent NES visit to medicine, the, uh, the staff development program was commended uh, as a particular strength of NHS Tayside. These are open to anyone and everyone, uh, and they're generic courses. They're not, not just for medicine. They're for anything and everything. So please do come along. They're a fantastic program. And now it's over to Nikki, who's going to tell, talk to us about making best use of the radiology department. It's nice to see the radiologists come out en masse from their darkened rooms, living underground. I don't think you've got any colleagues along with you, have you? No, they've, they've deserted said you. They come. No, they'll not know where it is. Uh, I think so. That's a problem. Okay, so your talk is here somewhere. I was. I, I was trying desperately hard not to make some kind of reference to Fifty Shades of Grey uh, with the grayscale images of CT scans. I think I've done very well not to mention it. Good. On you go. So, hi everyone. Um, I have dimmed the lights, but not quite completely in pitch darkness, so things have moved on from us living in, in pitch darkness. So, um, just background um, here, yeah, I'm one of the consultants here, um, I do very much general radiology, but chest is one of my lines, but I'm, I'm not going to be talking too much about chest, it's really, I want to shift away from whether you hate us and move on to love us, and I'm hoping that, well, I'll give you some tips today to, to improve the relationship um, between um, the hospital members and the radiology department as a whole. So just to set the scene, um, the main objective, the main message really I want to get um, through this afternoon today is just increase a bit of an awareness and an understanding of how you guys could make the best use. And we really want to optimize the service, really. It's not that we want to be um, negative or, you know, um, obstructive. Far from it. It's really to give you and the patient the best service we can offer. And I do want to take the opportunity today, it's not a huge room, but um, we try and take any opportunity to emphasize MRI safety. I know um, 
hopefully quite a lot of you are aware of this, but we really want to try and re-emphasize it as much as we can. So the session layout would be just a bit of top tips on how to submit that ideal ICE request. I know the ideal ICE request doesn't quite exist, but just a few hints on how to avoid um, us hitting the rejection button, which I'm sure you hate getting those emails. Um, and then we'll just finish off by going through a few clinical cases, um, which I hope are some interesting, some might just be very much mundane, but it's really just to show you that not one size fits all when you come to requesting, let's say, a CT. So let's go to it. So how do we make the best use? So just a bit of a layout on what is the best on how to just make our life a bit easier. As you know, we don't have the patient in front of us. You do. And there is no better way of knowing your patients by the physical examination and the information um, you gather from the clinical history. So other than just the presenting complaint, it is actually really crucial for us to know anything relevant to the history. Now, what we as radiologists see as relevant might not necessarily be deemed as relevant by yourselves. And I, I fully understand that. Perhaps if you're in a medical setting, you might think that maybe the post-surgical history might not be relevant at all to your patient, but it makes a huge impact on the way we interpret the images, knowing what you know, big surgery they've had in the past. So if you do know of any um, really big things that the patients have gone through, please document that. Um, with regards to chest, I've got a soft spot for chest. Please, 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 please tell us if your patient is a smoker. Just, if you don't write anything else, tell us if they're a smoker or not. Um, and the history leading up to the past, um, to the presenting complaint. You don't need to write essays, it's just crucial words. Now, we always seem to suggest that we like to be asked a specific question. And you've probably questioned why. You know, why do we ask this specific question? Aren't we giving you enough history and information there to decipher what's going on in our mind. But actually, it's not that straightforward. You know, you could be giving me a whole load of information that actually is ringing several bells in my mind and could be a whole cohort of conditions and diagnoses and that could, that could be listed, fitting in with the presenting complaint that you're giving me. So if you don't give me a specific question of what you think is going on with your patient, I mean, we all, I mean, I've, I've spent a bit of time on the medical wards and we all have that gut feeling that we know it might be going on with our patient. Just mention what you think the gut feeling is and what your patient has. And based on that, the reason why we ask it is based on what you think the condition is or what the diagnosis is. We will tweak and we will tailor the, the CT scan, for example, whatever imaging is needed, based on the diagnosis we want to identify. You will then, you know, as we go through this um, presentation, you will realize that as I said, not one size fits all. So the type of scan we do, the type of phase we do, the contrast, whether we're going to use contrast, if we're using contrast, what timing of contrast we're going to do makes a huge difference depending on what pathology we're trying to look out for. Indicate whether it's an inpatient or an outpatient. You might say, oh, this is pretty blatantly obvious. But actually, if you see how the ICE request is in default setting, depending on where you are, where you submit that ICE request from, it will set as default from the area you're in. So if you're in the ward, it will set as a default stated as an inpatient. And if you're in an outpatient clinic, it will set as an outpatient default. So if you're requesting an inpatient scan from your outpatient office, then this will come up in our outpatient pile and it won't be flagged up as soon. You know, we go through the inpatient requests on a very, very regular basis, you know, by the minute we're looking at them. Whereas the outpatient list, we only go through it in a certain bunch. So if there's something urgent, it's not the first time there'll be CTPA sitting there. And because it has been defaulted as an outpatient status, we don't get to see it till either somebody flags up saying, oh, when is this patient getting their CTPA and so on and so forth. The hospital site is also crucial. We see this a lot with the juniors when they're shift, they're, they move around in their different blocks. They'll have their default setting, let's say, a nine was, and then when they move over to PRI, it's still set as a PRI setting. So it's not the first time, again, I use CTPA as an example because it's one of the commonest we see. Um, you know, there'll be a patient sitting 
on the nine was request list, but actually the patient is actually in ward four in PRI, and then nobody knows where this patient is. So we're there trying to phone, um, and the only contact we have is the person who submitted this request last night, who was doing on calls last night in Perth, and we have no idea where the patient is. So it's really important to look out for these things. If you do request an outpatient um, follow-up scan, um, it is really crucial to specify the time interval. You know, it's not the first time, let's say, follow-up um, cancers, for example. You need follow-up in next, well, I don't know, six-month follow-up scan. Um, sometimes it's not indicated, and because the follow-up um, following certain cycles of treatment could be quite close, we might think that that is a duplicate request, particularly if cycles are, let's say, of, you know, scan after the second cycle or the fourth cycle or the sixth. So we could automatically reject that because we don't know if this is a duplicate or not. So really please um, indicate that. Contrast versus non-contrast is something that um, is important for us to know, and I understand sometimes it might be difficult for yourself to understand whether you, whether you wish your scan to be a contrast scan or not, but if you do submit a non-contrast um, request, which actually was deemed to be better of being with contrast, and um, let's say staging, for example, now most of our staging scans will end up being contrast scans unless there's a contraindication because of renal problems and so on. Um, it takes us quite some time to just go back into clinical portal to look for and see if there's the, the EGFR has been submitted and so on and so forth, whereas in the ICE request, um, you obviously have the click button now to tell you what the latest EGFR is. Um, you see, a non-contrast code for us will not automate to ask you what the EGFR is, and that's the problem you see. So it, it, it just won't trigger off this alert, whereas all contrast scans codes will trigger off you, you know, reminding yourself to tell us if the EGFR is adequate or not. <coughs> now, I kind of alluded a bit earlier about, you know, giving us the, the exact, you know, correct contactable details. Um, I know it's quite difficult for people to know um, who's going to be available around at the time when we're justifying these requests. So if you submit a request overnight, um, it's unlikely that the on-call registrar, FY, whatever, is going to be around next morning when we're around to vet them. But even if at least you tell us where the department is or, you know, who to phone as in your, the senior of the attending team, you know, if you give us a number of the attending team, that is better because we spend a long time trying to figure out who's what. And then because we're a very busy department, more often than not, we might just reject it and, and just trigger somebody to call us back. So it's really, really important. I kind of mentioned that, you know, sometimes the default contact phone number for some people is actually the ward secretary. So it's not the first time I see an extension number and I phone and it's Secretary of General Medicine somewhere in the hospital, and they obviously have no clue. So it, it's really important to have um, accurate details. So this is just an example of a screenshot of um, a typical CT um, abdo pelvis request. So the code for us, we've got all these fancy codes which are of, of no interest to yourselves, but we've got hundred, we've got nearly a hundred of these separate codes, um, and it's this is it's this that we tweak when we're justifying to indicate to the radiographers what type of scan um, we will do. When it is a contrast scan, it will later on I'll show you um, what the information is about the EGFR. So that will trigger off EGFR. If the code does not have contrast with it, it will just not give you the prompt of the EGFR. But this is a really good exemplary um, request um, information because it gives us enough information. We don't need a lot. You know, we don't need essays, really. You know, it takes us just as long to read it as you have to write it anyway. So it's really important to give us relevant information as to why you think this might perhaps be a bit more urgent than others and not routine. So clearly it's a young patient, um, recent surgery, and there's inflammation going on there, febrile. So... We will up the priority, and what we do is we've got a section in our, um, uh, in, on our screen whereby we will indicate to um, the appointments office and radiographers whether we're going to need to do this urgently or not. So we all come with, from you know, a background of being clinicians ourselves. So 
if you do indicate and tell us that you know this is urgent or this is semi-urgent based on the information we give, we don't actually really need to discuss any further. You know, we can understand that this patient needs to be dealt with sooner than than uh, later, and we will then um, justify it accordingly. As you can see, there's a question here. So this is really quite crucial, and it's really important because now I know that a portovenous face scan is good enough for this patient. We don't need to do different types of scans to see what's going on. If this was, let's say, query bleed, then that's going to be a completely different um, matter. And we'll go to that um, later. This is what I mentioned. So this is what happens in default. So if you're, let's say, requesting it from outpatient, this will show up for us as an outpatient scan, and it will come in the category of outpatients, and it might take longer for us to justify that. So this is what we then get to see um, with regards to the list of what you've clicked away. You know, is the patient disabled? You know, can they speak to us? What's their EGFR? And this is where the EGFR comes in. We've got the patient details there, and we see through all that. Now, where it comes to the bit on saying, have you discussed this with somebody? More often than not, if it's just the usual routine um, CT or whatever other imaging you're doing, it's it's fine, you don't need to really discuss it, but this really is relevant when you're discussing biopsies or, partic or drainages that are actually quite particular. We're a very diverse team in the department, and we all do our different um, little bits. So I will do a lung biopsy, but I will not do a bone biopsy. So there's no point putting um, a lung biopsy there unless we've discussed it, let's say, in the MDT or with the individual who is happy to take on the responsibility to perform that biopsy. So biopsies that are sitting there and they have not been approached directly to somebody then will just not get done unless you actually speak to the individual. Um, MDT discussion is usually quite good to let us know if this is something that's gone to an MDT because there could be some particular um, details that have been discussed and the individual vetting that um, is, is not aware of it. And it would be good to actually tell us if there's anything relevant to through that MDT discussion in the clinical details. <laughs> now, with regards to disability, you know, the, the word disability can be quite varied, um, and you can interpret it in so many ways. But for us, um, it's, it's actually quite crucial, even just being aware that the patient can actually physically transfer to the CT couch. You know, So if they're just... You know, you know, very arthritic patients who cannot physically step onto the couch or they need to be hoisted over to the CT couch. I use CT because it just end up, you know, it's one of the commonest things. We need to be aware of that. Plus also, um, a, a big disability we find actually quite challenging is people who are extremely hard of hearing and just cannot hear the instructions being given to them by the radiographer. For those of you who have never seen how a CT is being done or had, had not had a CT themselves, for example, if we're doing a chest CT, we tell the patient to take a breath in and hold their breath. And there's no one physically standing next to the patient there. Um, so if they don't hear this instruction, then we're going to get lots of breathing artifact. Um, so something like you know, hearing loss is actually quite a, a significant um, disability for us, although it might not um, seem that way um, in general. Now, this is an example of an MR request. Again, the same information and will apply and will hold. And again, we will prioritize it depending on, on the urgency. Um, so we often tend to prioritize our MRCP is quite high, in, you know, especially if there's a background of cholecystitis still going on. Now, with MR, though, the emphasis I want to um, bring on today is the dangers of MR. And sometimes, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to generalize, but we have had instances where this safety issue has been overlooked. Um, and it, it's, it's very much across um, the board, really. It's not juniors, not middle grades, it, it, including um, consultant body and so on. So this is just one thing to bear in mind. The MRI is a significantly strong magnet. And if there's any ferromagnetic component on the patient or somewhere within the patient, it can get dislodged or moved. If it is outside the patient, it acts um, as, as, as a projectile missile. And it could harm the patient very significantly, if not kill them. Um, and, and it's really something to bear in mind. Um, so if you are aware of, of any metal component in the patient or on the patient, you really need to inform radiology 
Um, and these are the patients that you really cannot um, refer for the time being in particular. We know that there are some MRs out there that are becoming compatible with pacemakers, but ours so far is not. Um, so we need to bear that in mind. And any of these you know, examples of implantable devices. Now, we have seen these time kind of things in our department. So despite the safety questionnaire got being and having been um, checked out with the, by the clinicians, um, we have noticed that maybe some honesty is slacking. Um, patients have turned up with pacemakers, and patients have turned up with these objects um, on them. So these are actually things that we photograph these in our department, um, and this could easily happen elsewhere. Um, but it's one of those things. And in fact, um, we're not just saying that we don't trust you, but uh, maybe we don't trust you, actually. We do go through the questionnaire again with the patient before they step into the MR department, because we've had uh, quite a few instances now of pace patients turning up with pacemakers for an MRI, we've added the extra question to act as a reminder to really make sure that your patient um, doesn't have a pacemaker. You know, if, if they can't communicate that to you, what I do is just go back to look at their chest x-ray, see if they have had a chest x-ray and see if it is there or not. Um, EGFR status is quite important for us to know since although the nephrotoxicity in, impacted by um, gadolinium is a very different um, um, you know, a mechanism and physiology to uh, contrast nephrotoxicity with CT iodinated um, um, uh, toxicity, but the same applies. So it's really important to go to all the questions again with your patient, whether they're sitting in front of you or over the phone. Never assume, never assume they don't have a pacemaker, never assume they've never had metal in their eye, never assume anything. And it's really important that you're aware if they can answer the questionnaire, because yes, we will be going to that questionnaire again with them before they step into the MR room. One thing to bear in mind, if your patient needs sedation, um, and this does not apply only if it is just GA, um, it's any sedation really, any light sedation for anxiety, claustrophobia issues. If they need any monitors, so let's say we've given them some, it does one, whatever, you can give them oral sedation, and they need oxygen monitoring, heart rate monitoring, it has to still go through um, the anesthetic department. There are um, a category of people, as you can see, named who are MRI trained anesthetists, and it's only these people who are allowed to accompany the patient with anesthetic equipment to monitor um, the patients um, for sedation purposes. So the way we go about this is you can submit a request as usual, but you need to come to the department, collect this form that um, we have um, um, drawn up, and um, once um, you have allocated a named MRI um, trained anesthetist and their team, including the nurse, then the MRI gets appointed. And we have had instances, you see, where people have mishandled the equipment, you know, wrong equipment that's not MRI safe has been taken into the MRI <coughs> scanning room um, or else put back in the wrong place. So then when the GA team come and look for their monitors, they just don't find them. Um, and it's just created a big hoo-ha. The one thing to make you aware of, we don't know if people are aware of this um, available service, is in Scotland we have free access to the um, radiology, to the Royal College of Radiologists guidelines. I see that about Scotland because England need their own designated password, but it is free for you to access via staff network, via ICE really. Um, and if you click on that, it will just link you directly to the iRefer website um, on, the, on the college website, which is just, just an example, and I just brought up PE. So what it does is just categorizes into um, system parts, and then you've got your clinical um, uh, questions. So are you thinking of a PE? So what does the college recommend as first line or second line indication? And it will give you a bit of information about it. So that's something that is there freely available for everyone. So that was really kind of my first bit, and I was hoping to go to a few cases now just to brighten up a bit the atmosphere, and that's less of me um, <laughs> being a bit, I know, sorry, I sounded a bit patronizing there, but it, there were a few messages that I really wanted to get across, and it, it's really something that helps us a lot um, if we all pull the same rope. 
So the first case, what I wanted to do here is just bring up um, a couple of cases um, related to a specific um, presenting complaint. So I'll be doing two cases about shortness of breath and another one, abdominal pain. So although the presenting complaint is roughly similar, the pathology and the underlying diagnosis is crucially different. So imaging is going to be tailored accordingly. So what we've got here is a 28-year-old gentleman um, who's complaining of sudden onset shortness of breath and right-sided pleuritic, pleuritic chest pain. So we've got an admission chest x-ray, which shows you this. So how are we going to interpret this? So fair enough, we do have a very large right pneumothorax. Is it simple? Is it tension? Let's just go back. So you can see that um, the mediastinum is not very clear here, but it, you get the idea that maybe it might be shifted slightly to the left. The trachea is very central, if not shifted to the, la to the right, to the left, sorry. So it tends to usually sit midline slightly to the right. But the crucial thing that's really quite important here that should catch your eye is that the right hemidiaphragm is rather flat, if anything depressed, as compared with the left-hand side. And when we see that, then you know that the pressures in there are actually significantly high, and that's going to be a tension in your thorax. So we hope none of our junior colleagues will miss that. Um, but the one thing that probably um, is important here is why does this patient have an attention pneumothorax? So if you look back at the lungs, I know there's quite a few respiratory guys here, so I'm sure they haven't, they've missed that. And they know this patient, some of them anyway, but there are abnormal lungs here. It's, it's significantly abnormal. So as a radiologist, there's no point in me just saying there's a tension pneumothorax here. I should interpret these, and based on the clinical information you give me, I can then make up my mind as to what I think is going on there. But if I don't have any clinical information, then there's no way I can tell what's happening there. So yeah, they're diffusely abnormal, and they're the airspace and, and opacification is rather ill-defined. You know, you can't really draw around that. But having said that, there are no effusions, although there's a small pleural reaction, which we often tend to see in the context of an acute pleural pneumothorax anyway. So what other information might really help us? So remember, the only bit of information we got at the start is just shortness of breath and right pleuritic chest pain. But if you do tell us what the patient's situation is like, so is there a septic picture, then that will slowly shift me away from saying that there's background infection. So he was afebrile and the white cell count was actually normal. What's his hemodynamic status? Well, this is what it was, and it would fit in with quite significant tension pneumothorax which needs to be relieved um, as soon as possible. Has he had previous pneumothoraces? No, actually, this was his first year. Now, the smoking history, like I alluded earlier, is really, really important when we're looking at the chest. And this gentleman, although he was relatively young, well, he was very young, actually, 28, um, he already had quite a significant smoking history. When we see diffuse lung disease, we always like to know if there's anything that could be... Um, that could impact onto a more chronic or alveolitic type of um, diffuse, perhaps interstitial lung disease. So it's nice to know if they've had any exposure to recent drugs, anything occupational, but no, there's none of that. So yeah, so we'll deal with the tension pneumothorax first. And as a radiologist with the clinician in heart, we are gonna be picking up the phone to make sure that the drain is put in as soon as possible. Um, we usually notice from the subsequent chest x-ray, in all honesty. So hopefully, if the next following chest x-ray has a drain in, then that's fair enough. I'm not going to be phoning you up to tell you, put in a chest drain if I know it's already in. Um, now, I've put in this um, that, you know, we don't actually pick up the phone that often, isn't it? How many times do we pick up the phone? So if we are picking up the phone to speak to you, it means we are really wanting to get an important message across. And I say this because we've had some instances in the department where, you know, senior colleagues of mine have phoned up the department and the call was taken by maybe a middle grader and it was completely disregarded. And then the patient had subsequent um, deterioration and they were informed that there was an abnormality that needed urgent um, attention to. So it's really important to pass this message um, to colleagues and particularly middle and junior graders that if radiologist phones, it means that there's something that needs dealing with there and then and don't wait till, so this was a handover time as well. So it just wasn't a good time. Um, so yeah, so, so what are we going to do with the diffuse lung disease? So 
If you gave us information whether there's infection or not, probably it's not infective. So no, it wasn't infective based on the information we were given. Um, there was no history of recent drugs, so it's unlikely to be a drug-induced, and it's unlikely to be occupational. So we were told then that he works in a law firm. Has there been any recent exposure to allergens or dusts? No, so it's unlikely to be um, hypersensitive in pneumonitis. He smokes, so could this be smoking related? Who knows? So th this was his CT actually, so these selected images. So prior to his quitting smoking, um, this is what it looked like. So this was the admission CT after the lung reinflated. You can see a bit of the drain still there in fact. He then allegedly stopped his smoking. We don't know if he stopped it completely or went back to smoking again. But this was a follow-up uh, scan, and you can see the degree of uh, ground glass opacification is, is much better. still hasn't gone completely. Um, I don't know if we've got biopsy result from this one, but the, the differential diagnosis here was probably it could be a smoking-related interstitial lung disease in, on the spectrum of respiratory bronchiolitis or Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So, so in, you know, crucial information like that makes a huge difference because had you told me he was septic, you know, a, a pneumonia, you know, especially the viral pneumonias, because easily, easily look like that. Um, so... So, so that's why we really want more information. So case number two, again, shortness of breath, but this is in a slightly different setting now. So we've got a, a, the bleep goes off for Reg B in the afternoon, and the call is coming from one of the FY doctors on the orthopedic ward. So the 75-year-old woman with sudden onset shortness of breath and chest pain. So we, they phoned the, um, the radiographer, the on-call radiographer, to come and perform a mobile chest x-ray on the board. And the clinical details on the chest x-ray request are SOB and CP question mark cause. Now, fair enough, I did medicine, so I know that CP is chest pain in this context, but it could be cerebral palsy, it could be child protection, it could be control panel, it could be anything. So I know we're all busy, we're running off our feet, but... We deal with the entire hospital, and it's been a while since I've done medicine, but I haven't done a fair amount of surgery, I haven't done any ophthalmology for any amount of time, I haven't done orthopedics. So every specialty has its own acronyms, and the same acronym could be used across different specialties. So unless we understand what the context of it is, we won't know what these initials are, and we'll just completely disregard them, and it could be quite crucial that that particular information could have impacted on the way I'm going to interpret these images. So please try and avoid shorthand. Now, we all know AP projections are in the ideal. It might just give us a bit of information um, if there's anything obvious going on, but as in this case, there's very little information it's giving us with regards to diagnosis. So it's very under underexposed. This patient is very rotated, and we can make out that there are some ECG leads. We can't figure out they've had a sternotomy, so could this, there could be a cardiac um, involvement in this problem. Um, so there is apparent cardiomegaly, but again, we have to be cautious with interpreting cardiomegaly on, on AAP. And could there be some pleural effusions there? We tend to always call these pleural effusions, but the patient is quite large. There's lots of soft tissue there, so it might just be superimposed soft tissue, and there might be no um, pleural effusions at all. So bottom line, we actually have no idea what's going on just from this chest x-ray. So what are we going to do? Give us a bit more history. So is there a septic picture? No, yet again, there's no, no sepsis. But there is pleuritic type of chest pain. So even the fact that you tell us what type of chest pain it is, central crushing versus pleuritic, might make me think of something else. Is the patient unstable? Oh, they're very unstable, actually. They've got low blood pressure. They've got con uncontrolled AF. Is it first time AF? Are they always in AF and now it's become uncontrolled? Who knows? But this would be actually quite important. You know, if you do tell us that, you know, Oxygen sats are really low. Despite us giving them a lot of oxygen, these sats are still really low. Um, do they smoke? No, actually, they don't smoke. So hopefully the background lungs might actually be okay. So why is she sitting in the orthopedic ward? We figured out it was the orthopedic FY, isn't it, who phoned us, but they never told us why she's there. So yeah, she had a hip replacement. So now it's going to be a very different picture, isn't it? Whereas before it could have been query MI, query pneumothorax, if we put an align in, now it's going to be query PE, isn't it? So if you give us the question query PE, then we will know what, what we need to do. 
Um, so based on that information, we now know that we need to do a CT palmy angiogram. When your patient is hemodynamically unstable, we'll go straight for a CTPA. We won't wait around and faff around with a VQ. Um, remember, VQs are not done out of ours anyway, so um, we'll go for that. And this is what she had. No wonder she was pretty and well. She had a big, large saddle embolus to this axial and coronal views. Um, what I tend to look out for, and most all my colleagues would do the same, is we will know if um, the opacification is ideal, so if that scan is good enough to be confident in saying whether there are, um, you know, if the opacification wasn't ideal here, I don't think we're going to miss these PEs anyway, but especially with smaller ones or the subsegmental PEs, if the opacification of the palmary trunk is not optimal, then we could easily either overcall clots that actually are in there because of mixture of flow as it slows down as it reaches the subsegmental or actually miss um, these small clots. So the region of interest that we draw there has to be more than 200 um, Hounsfield units. And we will comment on whether there's right heart strain. So I haven't quite included an image where the, the septum is shifted. So we'll look for enlargement of the right ventricle because of pressures increasing in the right ventricle. So it tends to displace or flatten the interventricular septum. And we also see reflux going back via the right side right side at heart into the IVC and into the hepatic veins. And, and as you can see, there's reflux of contrast there. Um, so this would be very much an, an arterial-ish phase. So it's not quite arterial as we do the arterial chest um, for our staging, but it's at a stage where we want to optimize the contrast in the palmy trunk. So what we tend to do is there's an automated um, function on the scanner, which is what we call bolus triggering. So we draw a region of interest, and when it hits the 200, hopefully that's when the scanner starts um, scanning. Um, with the automated pump. So this would be um, our report. Um, so yeah, so if we do tell you that there is large clot load, occlusive, bilateral, with right heart strain, then that is a significant PE. You know, I've had people on the phone that when I phone and tell them, look, you've got large bilateral, you know, clots there. It's like, oh, should I speak to my consultant? It's like, <laughs> so sometimes I, I don't know if what I write in my report, <laughs> it translates the same as the way I feel it when I write it in my report. I don't know how it's being interpreted on the other end. So sometimes mis um, there is a miscommunication by what we feel is important and maybe how it's being picked up on the other side. But yes, uh, that is when the, I do say bilateral large cause, it is a significant PE. So, so yes, yeah, so again, we'll be picking up. And as I said earlier, please give us the correct details because you know there's no point in me phoning the ward secretary to tell her that the patient has a PE. So I'll go through a few surgical ones here and um, so we see a lot of surgical um, patients and in fact we must admit that actually the bulk of our work ends up being you know from inpatient work is um, surgery. So with surgery um, surgical patients you know generalized abdominal pain could be coming from anywhere. So I kind of picked up a common um, presenting complaint, which we see all the time, which is abdominal pain and PR bleeding. Now, what the type of abdominal pain is, what the context of PR bleeding is, might vary. And depending on that, we will tailor the scans accordingly. So we've got a case here of an eight-year-old man um, who, who was so unwell that he needed ICU admission um, due to progressive generalized abdominal pain and you know, hemodynamically was doing pretty unwell. Now, they also comment on blood intermixed with stool, so who knows what that is. So they did an abdominal x-ray mobile exam, because we always do the way everybody gets their chest x-rays anyway if they come to AMU. So he's had an abdominal x-ray. So as you can see, the patient was very unwell in ICU, so we couldn't get an optimal projection here. There's you know, a good section of the patient that's not been included. I think it's not projecting very well, so it will be very cruel of me to ask you to point out anything. Um, but we can see that there are several dilated gas-filled bowel loops, very much on the left-hand side, but also in the central abdomen. There's an NG tube here that if you follow one, comes actually from the top, so it is actually in a good place. So we always look out first at our lines, make sure they are in a safe position. There's this extra line coming from somewhere, but it actually is outside the body. So it's always best to just rule out what is extra corporal. 
Now, what else can we see? Very little else, perhaps. So there's a prosthesis here, but we can't really see much of it. So we don't know anything else. And up here is for um, comment. Who knows? We can't see it very well. So we can see the NG tube. We can see the extracorporeal line and so on. So we can see some lucencies here. Now, always bear in mind that lucencies in places that we don't expect them to be are most likely to be pathological. So let's have a look. So, yes, yeah, so this is a suboptimal um, projection, which might give us very little information, but hopefully to the trained eye, it will actually give us much more. So are these large bowel or small bowel? But yes, a smaller caliber, there is this kind of um, co stack, stack of coin um, appearance. Well, these are large bowels, but these ones here are small bowel, which will give you an idea whether it's large bowel or, or, or small bowel. Beware of the fluid-filled dilated loops. Now, I've, I've slowly started shifting to be less confident in excluding obstruction or my abdominal x-rays because you can only, and I do have a few colleagues here of mine who might maybe think slightly different, but you can only exclude obstruction if there is gas in those dilated loops. If those dilated loops are now full of fluid, and that's what tends to happen with bowel obstruction when you get fluid sequestration, then you just cannot see the contrast between black and white. So I cannot exclude obstruction if I can't see those loops. And it's not the first time. It's small bowel obstruction. You know, you've got full-blown small bowel obstruction. All you see is just a haze on your abdominal x-ray, and you just can't tell if there's obstruction or not. Important to know where your lines and tubes are, so always look at the, the position first because that might, you know, really harm your patient if they're in the wrong place. And yeah, we couldn't really see that. So where was that um, unexpected um, gas? So we saw it right in the right upper quadrant. So let's have a look and see what other information that we could have been given that might have helped us know what's going on here. So the pain was very much generalized, tympanic abdomen guarding rebound, so they're very peritonitic and the bowel sounds were, were um, absent. There isn't a septic picture here, so there's no fever, but CRP is just slightly raised. How sick is your patient? Now, this is really the one thing that usually helps us a lot. If somebody is really, really sick with something like this, we start thinking down a certain line. Um, and we also, it also helps us know what their past medical history is. So they've had a STEMI, they've had an MI in the past, they're known type 2 diabetic, so they're bound to be arteriopaths. So you start thinking down the ischemic line of things rather than inflammatory or infective. They've got uncontrolled AF. So if you've got uncontrolled AF, think that there's something being shot off here. And they do smoke just to make their life even more worse from an arteriopath point of view. And lactate is high, so we don't often get this information. But if we do get that, then actually you kind of already clinched the diagnosis before you've even imaged the patient. So yes, yeah, so the abdominal x-ray actually was actually going to give us that information. So what we're going to do now is we will want to do a CT abdomen. Ideally, we'd do it, tr well, at least dual phase so that we can see the arteries and also see the venous supply. But this patient was too unwell actually to get the timing right for both. So we just thought we'll just go straight for the, um, the port of venous phase. Um, so hopefully if they can get um, contrast on board, because knowing that they've been going straight to ICU, then maybe their kidneys now are in shutdown. So that's another thing to bear in mind. So do you weigh the benefits, um, do the benefits outweigh the risks here, and should we just go ahead for contrast anyway, and then hopefully the renal team might come and save us, if they want <laughs> to save us, um, but that would be an extra step to take into consideration, you see, so um, they, there's, these things are quite complex, so we ended up doing a port venous phase, which is 60-second second, 60 second scan from time of injection, um, and this is what the scan showed us. So there is gas in places we don't like it to be. So you can see this branching pattern here. So this is taking up the branching pattern of the venous system and the port port venous system and gas within the port venous system is practically nearing moribund here. There are gas filled bowel loops, as you can see, small bowel and large bowel, as we saw earlier on that x-ray. But there's also a, a, a kind of string of pearl of gas here in the non-dependent area. Now air, rises against gravity, isn't it? So you shouldn't see any air below anything. So you shouldn't see any, any gas there. So if you see rings, you know, beads or locules of gas, 
and beneath, underneath, you know, in the non-dependent portion where feces and fluid is, that must be in your mucosa. It's, it's in the wall of your bowel. So intramural gas, again, is just a pretty much um, high, you know, high mortality risk there. So this was ischemic bowel. Um, so this patient, unfortunately, um, ended up passing away soon after um, the scan. So if we go back to the um, x-ray, in fact, um, that we saw earlier on, that network of that lace pattern of gas there, of gas, so th there's no bowel loop there. You can see the, the hepatic flexure is actually over here, so it cannot be gas within the large bowel. And it clearly is not the pattern of gas you expect from the posterior aspect of the lung, you know, in the costophrenic recess. So that was the portovenous gas there. Now just to bear in mind, um, portovenous gas tends to, be sen tends to be quite peripheral as compared to biliary gas, so this is very subtle and probably not projecting well at all here, but there's a large tubular lucency here, which is gas in the CBD. So if you bring up scans to compare them, this is what we saw earlier with portovenous gas, and this will be biliary gas. So let's say anyone has had an ERCP with, you know, sphincterotomy and so on, ends up having, you know, long-term gas in their biliary tree. So that's the way it should look. So the last case before we wrap up um, was uh, a, an old lady who came in with kind of non-specific abdominal discomfort, and again she had PR bleeding. This time it was a bit more fresh rather than intermixed with stool. She came into any recess, and this was her chest X-ray on admission, um, because they want to see if there's a perforation. So we did an erect AP. There's no free gas under the diaphragm. So hey, presto, we seem to be happy with that. Lungs seem to be clear, but there's very little else we can comment. The chin is obscuring the apices here, so it could be masking anything um, up there. From, but from the context of the clinical presentation, what we really want to know is, is there anything going on below the diaphragm? So no, there isn't. So what we're going to do is move on, do a CT, because everybody gets CT these days anyway. Um, it's our triaging system of whether they go to here, there, whatever. Um, so what kind of CT are we going to request? So it's really important, again, to give us the information. So is this septic? No, she didn't have any signs of septic. But she was actually hemodynamically unstable, low blood pressure, tachycardia. Sats were actually okay on air, um, and she doesn't really have, she is a smoker, um, but she was doing pretty well for being such a heavy smoker. Um, she's no rheumatoid arthritis, had a STEMI, and she's on a whole concoction of medication there. So what are we going to do? Are we thinking of anything sinister here? Now, this is just one single shot, one slice of CT abdomen at the level of the kidneys in arterial phase. So we've got a very bright aorta here. And in fact, everything else is very much a shade of gray. Now, the other bright spot that we can see is something here. Now, look at the difference between this. So see the two. So the difference between these two scans is that this is a portovenous face scan, so the aorta is much darker than it was in the aortic and the arterial phase, and that little tiny um, nub in there of high attenuation is now quite a large, ill-defined area of high attenuation. And this is what's telling us if the patient is bleeding now or has bled and the bleeding has stopped. So the fact that we can see quite a significant amount of volume there that has changed literally within seconds. So the difference between these two scans is 30 seconds. So one was done at 30 seconds from injection and this was done at 60 seconds from injection. It means that there's a very high flow of bleeding going on there for us to pick it up. We don't pick bleeds any less than a bleeding rate of 0.3 mils a minute, so it, seemed, it has to be pretty um, high flowing. So if somebody has had rectal bleeding and it's stopped, then we cannot really do a scan to identify the point of bleeding because we just won't be able to see it. It won't pick up the flow. So, so you see, when the information was given to us, um, we then, in, it started ringing bells to us that this is probably bleeding. It's not any other cause of abdominal pain and rectal, so it's active. So we had to do it in a, a port of, you know, dual phase rather than just the portovenous phase scan. Um, and these are kind of all, all the differences. We don't tend to give oral contrast to these patients because it could mask the high attenuation that we see in the lumen. So we don't want to do that. And just to bear in mind, as I said, we can only pick up a bleed if it is actively bleeding at the time. Now, more often than not, we don't actually find the cause, and if we don't find the cause in, in this age group, it tends to be under dysplasia. 
So hopefully I've got a few messages across today and hopefully I've, I've covered them. Um, so yeah, the reason why we ask for both medical and surgical, irrespective of where they are in the, in, in the hospital, it's really important for us to know. Remember, ask this specific question and we will give you a specific examination then, which is, which is much better. Um, hopefully we'll try and all be honest and safe about our MR requesting. And based on that, hopefully you'll get less of us telling you non-specific possible clinical correlation, please. And we'll, we'll press that rejection button a bit less often. Thank you very much. You'd mentioned shades of grey at some point in the presentation. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Nikki or any comments about any of that or radiology in general or anything? You mentioned oral contrast in, in the middle of all that. When I was a lad and uh, as a pre-registration house officer, my job every day on the surgical unit was to run down to see the radiologist to request all the CT scans and we'd maybe get one. Um, and we always used to do, get oral contrast, but I don't, we don't seem to do oral contrast so much anymore. Is that a change in, are, we, are the scans better, we don't need it, or, or, or am I just not in the right unit and actually you're doing stacks of oral contrast CT scans? <laughs> I think so. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, Tom is here to back me up on the GI side of things. No, the role of oral contrast is actually, um, it varies depending on the, on the pathology you're looking out for. So, for example, I find that I, I, I don't do a lot of GI imaging, but I find it quite useful usually when we're imaging patients where the query of the pathology is down in the pelvis. And that's because what tends to happen in the pelvis is collapsed small bowel loops tend to clump up in the pelvis. So... It all looks the same shade of grey, indeed, in, in that really tiny space, especially in, in well, ma males and females. So the you know the genital urinary organs are all clumped up together with the small bowel that collapsed, and you just cannot make out what's what. So you cannot make out what's ovary, what's uterus, whatever. Sometimes I mean you see the uterus, but it does actually, especially if there's pathology, it's actually difficult to make out um, the difference between the two. If patients, though, however, are unstable and are vomiting and so on, then it's not recommended to give oral contrast at all anyway. Um, and there are two types of oral contrast you can give. You can either give the really bright, you know, iodinated um, water salt contrast that we tend to use, or else water in itself, you know, just ordinary water, will act uh, as a contrast, and it's better tolerated by the patients, and it's just like drinking any other glass of water, and it just really helps us um, make out what's bowel and what is not bowel, really. So, so yeah, we do use it quite a lot. And decubitus abdominal films, that's uh, gone with the water. Gone oh, no. away, is it? We used to do a lot of those back in 2000. The cubitus film to look, for, <laughs> to look for small bowel obstruction. Yeah, no, the abdominal film for query perf is gone out. So, yeah, obviously that's only, and we don't do the whole fluid layer levels anymore. So, it's just erect chest x ray, please. <laughs> okay, dinosaur here, never mind. <laughs> um, anybody else want to say anything? Yeah, oh, I've, I've not prepared a microphone. I'll get one. Here we are. It's just a comment, really. I guess um, as endocrinologists, we do lots of MRI scans, and I guess I'm fairly anxious. So I always make note of what metal work they've got in there and often pop down to MRI. And often, I'm well, almost on every occasion, oh, you don't need to worry about that, or you don't need to worry about that. I guess it's the um, balance, isn't it? Because in the end, it makes you create, oh, I don't need to... Believe me. I don't need... You know, you kind of look about, you know, what surgical clips they may have had in the past, what type of... Uh, 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 orthopedic procedures and all the time, yeah, that's fine, yeah, that's fine. And I, I guess it's a balance, isn't it? What do we really need to worry about? And I guess pacemakers and stuff in the brain versus yeah. uh, everything else. I think you're, if you're ever in any doubt, it's always best to just comment in the clinical details what you think the patient has. I know it's a bit maybe a step too far. If, if, if let's say it's a device and you actually have a sticker in the medical note that tells you what the device is or whether it's titanium, whatever, blah, 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 just document it because what we tend to do is we end up processing these requests via our physicists and they'll know exactly what, can, what is MR compatible or not. And then if they have any doubt as to what it is or whatever, they will actually contact you directly. But... We'd rather you're over cautious than under cautious. Believe me, it saves a patient life, a patient's life if you're over cautious. So, um, in fact, I will, I will hail you to that if, if you do, if you are concerned. Well, I've had three MRI scans, and the adamantium inside my skeleton has never caused any problems. Good. 
joke for Pete. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. We'll call it a day. Um, next week, just before you go, next week is the Cullen Prize uh, g- giving presentation. So you'll have received emails uh, asking for, to uh, nominate people or self-nominate for the Cullen Prize, which is a, a Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Prize for Excellence in Service Provision. Uh, and we got a load of, uh, of nominations. I was on the panel. This is some really fantastic bits of work that have been going on over Tayside that you probably have no idea about because I certainly didn't know about most of them. Uh, Brian Singer is going to lead the, the grand round next week. He's going to give a brief synopsis of all the, pre- of all the submissions. Uh, the, the board are cancelling their board meeting and they're going to come down here to, to grand round to be part of it. Um, and it's really worthwhile coming up some fantastic work that's been going on. Uh, and I'm hoping that all of the people who submitted work for the Cullen Prize will do a grand round in the new year. Um, so that's next week, normal time. But the last thing to do is just thank Nikki for coming along and giving a nice presentation with some interesting shades of grey. <laughs> Thanks very much. See you next week.